So let's look at React, some of the core principles and the functionalities. And uh, so, yeah, again, I'm not going to dive too deep into the history of it, but you're more than welcome to look at it. Um, you know, but some important features about React is that it is a declarative uh, JavaScript library. Now, you know, it's debatable that some people actually say React is a framework. You probably hear these two terms, framework library, being used interchangeably, but I believe technically React is a library as opposed to a framework. And, um, you know, sometimes you might wonder what is the difference between the two anyway, you know? So for me, the easier way to understand the difference between the two is that a framework is usually something that comes everything with it and has a very strict uh, rules uh, how you can actually build app uh, using the, the framework. So think of a framework like a mode or a template of some sort. And to use that, that library, you actually are at the mercy of that framework. So you build your pages, your content, have to be have to mode into that framework. Okay, so you have less uh, flexibility there. And in a library, it's it's usually about the opposite. Library is that you want to you want to use the React or in this case a library to uh, integrate into your application. So it says you can treat a library like a little widget if you want, or it can be an entire web page. But that's how I will actually view or um, understand the difference between the two. So if that helps. Right, so um, React is in, indeed um, focuses mainly on the UIs, which is the view or the V, the v for the M and the MVC model paradigm. Um, uh, it's you know, been released since 2013, right about the same time as TypeScript, as we looked at last week, right? So they're about the same, same age, if you will. And it is maintained by Facebook at this GitHub site. Um, so you can go there and look at all the code. It is open source. So I mean, Play with it, you know, get a copy and just um, poke around, okay? But uh, that is basically about React. So over here are some technology trends. I pull this data directly from the Stack Overflow survey every year. Stack Overflow, you know, um, uh, pull a, a survey, which is really, really useful because they have about, oh, I would say 60,000 to almost like 80, sometimes 100,000. Uh, responders responded, and most of these responders actually um, professionals. So I would say they're pretty valid in terms of um, the responses you have. So you can see that JavaScript is still the hardest language out there, I guess, in terms of in, in the web um, development realm. Eleventh uh, year in a row, the most commonly used language. Um, Sixty-five percent. That means the percentage of all the uh, developers. Okay, not the entire all languages. And React and Node.js. Um, let me type JS here for the React. These are the two most common web technologies used by professional developers. So, you know, a very good combination there. Um, and TypeScript, right, it's ranked top top five. Again, the most commonly used programming languages out there as well. And of course, the P4 IDE by most professional developers is uh, VSC. Um, if you haven't used it, if you don't um, know what that is, you know, I highly recommend it. Go and try it out, okay? So the survey is really nice. If you go over there and look at it, you can go, you can go back, like I think, up to like five, six, seven years, or probably longer. Um, you can look at the history of these uh, on technology and trends. You can see that um, how where they are, where they're heading, and I think they also include some like salary and pay rates and things like that as well. So really good stuff. And so I think learning React and you know TypeScript and, and um, JavaScript, you are in a really good field right now, at the moment. So here, let's, um, I'm going to come back to this part again later when we um, set up the app, okay? So we'll follow these steps here. Um, but I'm going to switch over to the next couple of slides, which, um, okay, you see none, we'll come back to revisit this. I'm going to go right into the component, the architecture. Okay, so for those of you, I know that some of you are already a React engineer or developer, so this is probably not new to you, maybe a review, but, um, um, Maybe for most of you, it's completely new. So let's take a look at what that architecture looks like. Okay, so think of it, you know, like a web page, like you see here. Um, React is a component-based uh, uh, library, very much like you know React and Amia, Angular, and Vue as well. Most of them are, 
but it is a component-based uh, library. So at the heart of React is the component. So you can think of it like a component as simple as a, um, a tiny widget on a web page like you see here. Each of these like rectangular shape down here could be a widget or a component, and, or the entire page can be a component, React. Okay, you can have nested components within other components as well. And we, and we can actually get to do this a little bit later, um, how, how that works. But um, yeah, that is basically it. So the neat thing about React is, is because it's a library, so you don't have to you know, build the entire page. If you just want to use a little widget, like your um, navigation bar, for example, you want to use that as a React component, you can easily integrate that into your application. And it doesn't matter what, what um, technology you use, as long as you know, you have HTML, CSS, because, you know, React is a front-end uh, library only. So that's why it's, you know, preferred by most companies nowadays, right? Even, um, uh, you know, other companies like Google, for example, would use React as well. All right, so um, that's a just an, an analogy, by the way. I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, be you actually use a React. They might, I'm not sure. But... Think of it like when you build a application, okay, in React, uh, the idea is you want to break down your components to a small component, as small as possible, even like a single search bar or um, a single image or, or icon, or even like the logo of your website, you can put that into a single module or component. So we have all these components all together, and they're all linked to a certain, um, you know, parent components, and you keep keep going up the chain or down the chain, how we look at it, is you're going to have a, a series of dependent components, and they depend on one another if you use in your application. Okay, so uh, that dependency is, is pretty um, sensitive. So if you crash, if something in your tree has some error, if it crashes, then usually the entire app crashes. So that's something you want to watch out for. Okay, but certainly you can see here, uh, on the bottom is the index HTML. So you have to bootstrap your, your React uh, application to the DOM, which is um, any HTML you, you choose. In this case, of course, it's index.html, but any, any page doesn't, doesn't really matter, okay? Um, we inject the entire app into a, any you know, a element of your choice, given an ID, and then I'm, I'm sure we have done this before already, you know, how do you manipulate the DOM using JavaScript? It's the same idea. So we've got to inject the index.js, which is the entry point to your React program, okay? So we inject that to, or bootstrap that to the index, and then all the other components will be injected to that index, the entry point, and that's how it goes. So, so you can see here, this is the entry point, the index is, it has its own CSS that is, you know, can be imported into the index here. And then up the chain here, um, we have the app component. This is the root component. So in React, every application in React, you must have a root component. Um, so in this case, called app.js. It doesn't have to be called that. You can call it whatever you want. It doesn't matter. And then from that component, you have other some components that can be injected to that in a root component. So, in the, so at the component level, the app.js level, you can have your own CSS and then you know, import that in as well. Okay, so of course, if you think about CSS, it will cascade down your pages, right? So because, you know, the root component is at the top, uh, even though I draw here, it's like going down, but actually this is the top of your uh, components. So all the other subcomponents, like the nav bar and login and whatnot, if they are indeed being used in uh, or injected to the app.js component, then the style sheet will actually cascade down to all of them as well. Okay, so that's something you also want to watch out for. If you want to use a style sheet that applies to all your site, the entire site, you will add it to the app level, or even you know, you can go as far as out there to the index uh, level, and that will apply globally to your your um, components. If you just want you know CSS applied to a certain component like your nav bar, and in here you will create your own nav bar um, CSS and apply only to that particular. Okay, but you can see you can see how we can. A, a component like a, the login component here can be injected into a couple of locations. The nav bar can have a login um, component as well as the footer as well. So, question in the chat, second here. Um, says one app.js per web page or for the whole site? 
Uh, good question. It depends. Okay, it depends how you want to build your app. If you were to build your entire web page uh, in React, then yeah, it's one app JS. Uh, but again, okay, so so really, when you build a React ap application, even an Angular or or Vue doesn't really matter. You actually bootstrap that application to a single tag, and you can use um, in this case, like in the index HTML, this you want div tag with the root ID, and this group of components will be injected to that particular ID. So you can have multiple uh, React apps on a same page, okay? You don't have to have just one. You can have this, there's no limit to how many you can have. So maybe my second app on the same index page might be a different div tag and I give the ID of root two. So in that root two, I may have the similar or same structure and my in that root two, I will have app.js as well. So they are in, in, in completely um, you know, separated. So as long as you know in that particular application, yeah, there will be a one root component for each of these tags that you inject that in the application too. Okay, so um, does that make sense? Okay, great, thank you for the question. All right, so using this you know, components here, then you can uh, you build something like this, right? Of course, usually you wanna build this first, right? You, you build the, out like the output first, how you like it, and then you go and build the actual components. But I'm just showing you here the, uh, the other direction. So you know your components can be rendered to the browser, and then here you might have something like this. So here I show you the login component is injected to both the, or nested into the uh, nav bar, which is this navigation bar here, and it's also in the footer, right? Just to show you that you can put this any way you want. And once you add it to those um, components, um, as far as I know, they are actually compl uh, they are actually independent, okay? Like an object, right? Every object is independent. Okay, so that's that. And then let's look at the basic component of the React. We'll dive a little bit deeper now. So in a component, uh, whether it's a function component or a class component, there are two types, okay? The class component is also referred to as the stateful component. That is where you maintain the state. Uh, a state is very special in React because anything that is attached to the state object or a state um, property, uh, that those data are reactive in the view. So if you make changes to your state data, it will reflect in the view directly and, and it's usually live, okay? If it's not part of the state, then um, it's not reactive. If it's not reactive, that means that, you know, React would not re-render the view, so therefore you won't see any changes, okay? So uh, that's why, and I mean, in the past, now, I mean, because of these many hooks you can have now, but uh, in a classical example is that a class component is usually used when you want to retain or maintain state. So the class component will have the state property, it's a property uh, object called state, okay? It also has props as well. So in the other component, which is the function component, that type of component does not maintain state, I mean, naturally. Uh, you can nowadays if you want to, but, um, it, you know, uh, from the get-go, when they built that, it was not supposed to maintain state. And so usually a function component will have only props. Okay, so properties. So and if you want to use, you know, state in a um, function component nowadays, you have to go through what's called hooks, okay? So in that component, um, you have, I'm showing you here the app component, which is the root component. Within the root component, you have a container component, you know, any, for example, like my navigation component, for example, right? And then that component can have either props or state, or both, depending on either it's function or class, okay? And then here is the view, okay? The view here is a, your template, of course. I'm showing you here, it's like you're, you're separating the code uh, from, you know, the way you see here, right? Actually, it's not, okay? It's all into the, built into the same JavaScript file um, into the same function um, only. So, so we just, you know, draw this way, you can see a little bit better. But you can pass data uh, to the template, you know, to the view via the props object, or with the state object if it's a class component, okay? And so here in the view with a template, 
you can register events just like you register events to your DOM, to your HTML elements, and those events will be um, handled by handlers. Again, all this happened within the same JS file, okay? Um, so sometimes it's a little bit confusing, a little bit tricky, but um, once you get the idea, we hang over it, you, it, it starts start to make sense. Uh, also, I want to point out that React, uh, data in React, only flows in one direction, so it's unidirectional only. So it always goes from the, the, uh, its source uh, out to the view, and then um, from there out to sub um, components. I, I probably I should say that uh, data flows from one component to the next component in a one direction only. Okay, but in terms of you know data binding within the same component, yeah, you can bind data from the source out to the view. And you can do that from the view to the source uh, via the handler as well. So I think this is the same as doing um, data binding in the, in the DOM. Okay. Um, in some uh, framework or libraries like Angular, for example, you have a um, very nice two-way data binding, which you can bind both to the source and the view simultaneously, which is really neat in Angular. But you don't have that here in React because React um, it's only one direction from you know either source to view or view to source, but not both. But there are ways, you know, there are workarounds you can actually um, create and mimic that same uh, feature. Okay, so that is basically the basic React component. Um, here is how you can actually build one. I'm showing here the code is a class component, uh, so called app, right? And you need to extend the React that component class. And then from there on, you have your state. I, what I have here is very simple. Um, I do not have the constructor, as you don't, as you, as you can see. You don't have to have a constructor unless you want to, um, you know, bind data, initialize data, or um, bind bind other functions like the handlers here. That you have to have a constructor. But of course, again, things change a lot. So uh, from you know the last five years or so until now, we have arrow functions. And using arrow functions, you can bind the function directly. In the traditional way, you will have to bind the function, uh, you know, manually in the constructor. If you don't do that, you're not going to be able to change any state at all. So, um, you know, things change quite a lot uh, over the years. But this, so this is very, very common nowadays to use arrow functions. Uh, arrow function will automatically bind your state to the state objects. So you can just, you know, change states and, and whatnot. Okay. And then this component has a render function. This render function only applies to a class component. If it's not a class component, you're not going to have a render function. Okay. You just return the data. So this, this class component will return uh, the data via the render function, and then this is where you have the view. So this view is it's been returned and then rendered to the DOM. Okay. And so what you have here is kind of like we see the output over here. Uh, some rules we'll look a little bit later, also in the uh, reading material. So please go through them uh, about how you can, you know, style CSS directly uh, inline, like I see here. Okay. Also, you can apply to um, uh, using, uh, you know, a style sheet as well. But you notice how how you do here is a little bit different, right? You have like double curly braces here to separate the um, property and the value, right? And um, so you have to do it this way in React because what you see here, even though it looks very similar to HTML, okay, all of these code here are not um, HTML, okay? These are all JSX, which is the language extension used uh, in React by default, by the way, okay? So um, that's like, that's why a little bit different. And also, if you were to, you know, let's say if you take this file and want to validate it, the, the validator, it's not going to pass the validator because this is not compiled code yet. Okay, so I'm just letting you know. All right, so that's a simple one. And then here is uh, something about the virtual DOM, which is again at the heart of React, is is having this concept of the virtual DOM. We have been so far, we you know, be dealing with what's called the real DOM on the HTML, and then there's also the physical DOM, right? The physical DOM is actually the actual file, the HTML file itself, the actual code you hard code into that file is called the physical DOM. 
And this is the real DOM and the React creates another one called the virtual DOM. So, so question in the chat. Uh, as far as I know, no, I, I, I don't know um, if there is one, but, um, you know, I mean, that, but they might have like a linter that you can lint and, uh, you know, validate your JSX, but not the one that we use to validate our HTML stuff. Okay. Good question. And if anybody knows, um, please share. But as far as I know, um, you have to use a linter. Okay. So here we have the virtual DOM and the real DOM. So how does React work? And what is a virtual DOM anyway, right? So it is another copy of the real DOM. So what happens behind the scene is that React, so when you bind your, your, app, your app to the, let's say the div root, right, ID root, when that happens, before React renders data to the HTML to the DOM, it actually has to create a virtual DOM first, okay? So it's not the other way around, okay? So React is not gonna go to your web page and then, you know, look at your DOM and then rebuild that using, and then go this direction, it's not. It actually build the virtual DOM first. Once you build that, then if everything is successful, there's no error, okay, everything is good to go, and then it will render your the virtual DOM to the real DOM and that's what you will see on the browser. And it happens really fast before you can tell, um, but that's what happened, okay? So it keeps a copy of the real DOM at all time. So anytime when there's any changes made to the DOM, okay, we have we actually rendered that part only. So think back to like in the old days we have like before Ajax, right? And that's how Ajax came to existence as well. We want to modify or change only one particular place in the web page. I don't want to reload the entire web page. So how do you do that is we use Ajax. Now React does similar way uh, by looking at your two uh, DOMs. And let's say, here's an example, a bit small, I'm sorry. Uh, but you can see that, let's say that, you know, I focus on the H1 here. If something happened, maybe you click a button or some sort and you load something and then you change the content of the H1. Okay, so notice here, we are changing the content in the real in the uh, virtual DOM, not the the real DOM. Okay, in the real DOM, you have like buttons and you provide all these uh, features so that the user can interact with. But when something happens uh, from the real DOM, it's going to go into the React live, uh, um, you know, an engine, um, and it will look at the virtual DOM and it modifies the content in the virtual DOM. And then once that has been changed or whatever that is. Uh, if it's a state, right, it has to be a state, and we'll trigger that um, rendering a process, and it will compare this new virtual DOM uh, with the actual DOM before, right, the real DOM. If this, so you can see that, okay, now H1 has been altered. Let's say we change the content and whatnot, and then uh, when that happens, then React will actually re-render a new real DOM so that it will map, again, one-to-one -one back to the real DOM. Okay, so that's what happens behind the scene. Okay, if you make one change, it will just update that. If you make a couple of changes in the tree here, here over here, it will only change those locations. So it's not going to re-render the entire uh, component. All right? So that's uh, a pretty cool thing. And here is, um, you know, you can try this out. Probably not going to have time to do this, but I, I just put some code in the um, reading material. So if you just copy and paste, look at it. I go into the console and look at uh, you know, what happens when you click the traditional uh, DOM manipulation, how we did that quite often already, uh, using the traditional and then using the virtual DOM in React. You can see it's slight difference uh, when you change content. So when I update this count, you know, uh, you will see a little flashes at the P tag and the actual content. So both of these were actually flashing at the same time. That means that you actually re-render the paragraph tag. Okay, when that flashes, the P also get re-rendered and the content also get re-rendered. And in a um, couple years ago, you know, uh, I, I think the HTML um, uh, has been changed quite a lot and makes a lot of upgrade as well. In the past, it used to be that anything that is nested within that, uh, you know, tree, say if I have, if I put the P tag inside the div tag, and if I make some changes within the P tag, the entire div tag will also get re-rendered. So if you have a nested tree 
within the div tag, the, all of those will be rendered, which is why it's not very efficient. I mean, it was for a small apps, not a big deal, but some, you know, some really big app, like, you know, if you deal with great light, very sensitive or live data, like the stock market or something like that, you want something to be very precise only. And so React handles that very beautifully. And if you were to do that using React DOM, you can see that uh, you only see the number six, you know, being flashed because that's the only thing that is being altered. So the word count here, you won't see that at all because it stays the same as this. And then the P tab won't flash either. So it's just whatever you change, only that piece will get modified. And that is the beauty of React. Okay, It does that very efficiently, very fast. Um, that's also why it's the preferred library of choice by many, many companies. Okay, so that's that little thing there, you know, may not mean so much, but it's it's important to understand the the effects of the virtual DOM and how React actually um, render content using that approach. All right, so now let's look at JSX index. The JSX, again, it's this um, acronym for JavaScript XML. And because XML is there, okay, it's very strict. It follows the rule of XML. That means every tag must have a closing tag. Okay, whether it's a single-sided tag or a double-sided, you have to close it. Uh, usually in the HTML um, you know, uh, language, you don't have to close any single-sided tag. Okay? Um, it is declarative, which is kind of nice for React because you're able to um, combine, if you already saw earlier, combine um, like JavaScript and uh, HTML and CSS all together in the same space, and they look kind of weird because you have a piece here, a piece there, you all put together, and you're basically using this declarative approach as opposed to imperative, right? So you can describe the view better. It's easier that way. Uh, of course, you can create your entire application using JavaScript and React. You know, that's some of the components can also be done that way. Sometimes you have to do that way because the declarative programming uh, syntax doesn't give you that feature. So, um, like you can create a DOM element like the H1 or whatnot, like you would normally do using regular standard uh, JavaScript. But you don't have to do that because, you know, JXX provides you that very nice feature. So, you put your tag like H1 or paragraph or div tag inside your uh, um, React component. Those are actual components, those are actual the um, DOM element that gets created in the background by, you know, like document that create elements, right? Like by all those stuff. But you don't have to code it because the, de the declarative approach gave you that nice, uh, easy feature. Just some things that you want to watch out for is that um, the React components, when you create your own components, you must use Pascal case uh, or capitalize case, I guess. So, so you cannot use lowercase. Uh, as far as I know, React will not accept that. If you use a lowercase, then React will treat it as a standard. I mean, not of course, it's not the actual syntax, but a, it will treat it as a, um, when it compiles, it will treat it like a HTML element. Okay, so all HTML elements should be in lowercase only. Anything that is uppercase, it's a React component. So let's say if you happen to put an H1 tag in your, your uh, your view, you, you capitalize H1, then React would think that is a component that you create. If it doesn't exist, then it crash. Okay, so just be very careful about that. Um, you can also include JavaScript expressions. Uh, we'll do maybe a little bit of this conditional rendering and any comments, normally, right, comments. You embed those within a pair of curly brace and the JSX syntax. Okay. Um, uh, the class name, this is only used for if you want to style uh, a tag uh, using inline style, then you have to use the word class name as opposed to the keyword class. So in HTML, you would, you put class equals the class right name. But in, in, in JSX, you can't use the class because it's, uh, it's a reserve word. It's a keyword used by JavaScript and it has conflict, so that's why. Um, so let's go here to the next one. Uh, oh, one more thing here. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure this is true for all JXX, but I mean, in terms of um, and the context of React, uh, you must have a single root component. You cannot have like uh, two tags by themselves and just floating around. Okay. I'll show you in a bit. 
So some basic syntax, again, looks very similar to HTML and JavaScript altogether. Um, if you notice, in a regular you know, JavaScript, you're not going to be able to do something like this. This is, looks like JavaScript, right? It's not a, not a big deal. But look at this part here. You have an element that is assigned with this thing here. So this is the H, this is like HTML, right? Assigned with like JavaScript or mixed together. And here you have a curly brace here. You have a text or string interpolation. All all this stuff here, right? You assign this whole thing. This is called a um, you can call it a component. Assign that to the variable element, and you can use those in your um, your rendering. Okay, so I show you three different ways you can assign data, and then you use them in the rendering inside the curly brace like so. So you have basically either text or I guess you can call it um, element interpolation. You put that right inside here. Okay, so you must have, you must wrap these elements with a div tag. If the div tag is, doesn't exist here, then this would not be valid. Okay, so here is just some, you know, do's and don'ts. Gonna show you a little bit what they mean. So here is the incorrect syntax because here this function or this app component returns two elements and they are not nested within the root component. Okay, so again, you must have a root component like down here. They have to be nested inside of another component of a div tag or any of the container tags. If you don't want to use a div tag, you can leave it out. Just use the, the you know, a pair of angle brackets like this, a blank ones, and that's fine. Because an angle bracket with nothing in it, I think um, React would treat it as a, um, a fragment, okay? So that would be fine too. Here is a um, conditional, conditional rendering. You cannot use like, you know, JavaScript here or something here. And this is like a JavaScript code, right? So you can't do that. You have to use, um, in this case, the uh, ternary operator or the conditional rendering here. If this is true, then right, render this. Otherwise, render this over here, okay? And again, make sure you put inside the curly brace. If it's not, and just if you don't do that, it's just gonna be plain text. It is, um, so a few more, but that's uh, something you wanna look into. Components. So here we have a class component, kind of something what we uh, we looked at uh, a while ago. So a class must extend the React component. Yeah, I'm going to show you here almost like everything you need here. So you have a constructor that also receives props, and then you pass the props directly up to the parent component with a super um, keyword here. And the reason why you have props is because you have to imagine that this component could be a child component, right? So a parent component could pass data to this child component via the props. That's why you have the props here, okay? And then this is a class component. So if you want to retain state, you would then create a, a, um, a variable called state, assign that with an object. Okay, it could be, it could be an object, it could be just another um, uh, pr primitive data type, that's fine too. As long as it attaches to the state, then that data, the piece of data is reactive, okay? So here we have, an object of greeting with the text hello. This is the like initialization pro process. And then here we have another function called update greeting, takes a single element, and we set the state, we change the state basically. So when you make changes to your state, your data, okay, don't do something like, you know, let's say if I change the state from the greeting from hello react to let's say hello world, then inside here you would not say this dot state equals hello world. Okay, if you're doing that, it will not work. Uh, it may work. Uh, but it will cause a lot of issues, so it is not recommended to do that. To make changes to your state, you have to call the function called set state. Okay, and then inside a set state, a uh, couple ways to do this. Uh, one easier way is basically to kind of reiterate what you have here is whatever you have inside this state here. I'm showing you here only one property called greeting. This could be a a, a very um, deep uh, nested um, object. And whatever is changed inside that particular object, you have to basically navigate down to where that property is and then make that changes. Once that has been altered, any value, any data in these and the state has been altered, then only then will the view be rendered. Okay, if it's, there's no changes, then you know there's no comparison using that process we show I showed you earlier. Um, I think it's the term they, they call it a diffing algorithm to, diff, to, to, to compare the two, okay? So 
use this approach. I'll show you a little bit later how uh, there's another way to do as well, uh, using a callback function as opposed to passing the object directly here. And then again, a class component which has a render function, you return a component back, okay, an element. Um, and then, you know, because I'm using a class, so when you access these data here, you must go to the this uh, keyword. Again, just like JavaScript, uh, nothing different here. And then here we have a similar one. Uh, this is called the function component, which is a stateless that's not retain state. Um, usually you will see that most uh, components are function components because it's just cleaner, less verbose, and it's just easier to maintain. Okay, because now we have hooks, so you can easily also retain state with the function component. So I'm, I'm kind of wondering maybe someday, I don't know, they might even get rid of all the class components. We'll see. Um, okay, so here we have the handle function here. So if it's it's a function, so all your functions and um, other keywords or variables, you can declare it just like your regular function in regular JavaScript, right? The other one here, it, it we're dealing in the class space. That's why you don't can't use you know the word function or let or whatnot in the global space here. But a function, just like a function. Okay, again, it must return a um, an element back either a, a DOM element or a React um, element or a React component. Okay, so just one thing about data binding here, um, kind of talked to you already earlier. So we have a component that has a state called greeting, has the content called Hello React. Uh, it will bind that from the source to your template, the view, via the curly brace, right? You inject that or you um, include that in your code and that will actually render the content here. Uh, what I what I have here is actually I'm passing data to a different component, but uh, the same idea. And if you make changes to your um, view over here, then steps two will get triggered. Like right? it's via an event handler. When that happens, then you know this process will, will actually run in the background, right? Change the state, update the greeting, and you set the state here. You change the state here. So when that happens, then the React will actually render because the state has been altered. So number five and six will render, and then it will pause here again until the whole process repeats again. All right, so that is basically, you know, in a nutshell, um, the core concept of React.